Well, hello and welcome to Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. My name's Ian Tyrrell and uh, I've been doing a series of videos with Harry Metcalf, Harry's Garage, which seem to have got quite a lot of um, favourable comments. And people have said, well, you've got the workshop, you, uh, you have a sort of constant supply of, of uh, very nice classic cars to fix. So why don't you do um, a channel about actually sharing some of the jobs that you get in the workshop? So that's what we've decided to do. I've decided to, uh, to give it a shot. So here we are uh, in the workshop. We've got um, some cars are in for full restorations. Some are in for a quick repair job, uh, maybe a misfire on the engine or something, and then they're out again. So I'm going to try and sort of give a little sample of each thing and, and blend them in and share some of the work that we've got going on. So one of the first projects we're going to be looking at is this. Um, it's a Lamborghini Miura, which is arguably one of the most um, admired and beautiful cars ever built. As a model, it was voted the coolest car in the world by Top Gear, I think, 2016, 2017, something like that. Um, this particular car is very special because it was um, owned by a gentleman in the Black Forest in Germany from new in 1969 till 1973. And then from another chap who bought it from him right up till um, very recently, sort of 2015, 2016. And his family put the car in auction uh, in London in October 2019 and uh, the car got sold for, it's very much in the public domain, it's no secret, it got sold for £1.248 million. Pounds. A lot of money. Um, one of the reasons why this car did sell for so much is that it is outstandingly original. Um, I can't even bring myself to bring the black dirt from the black forest off the car to start cleaning it, never mind restoring it. So let's have a look at some of the things that make this car particularly special. So the Miura um, was styled by Marcello Gandini in 1966, um, or 1967, launched, and um, he incorporated all sorts of amazing out there styling elements in the Miura. And one of them was these beautiful eyelashes, which are made up of individual pieces of sheet steel. Um, because this car lived in Germany, it had to uh, comply with the tough regulations, as they're called, which is the sort of German MOT test um, that we had in England for these cars on, at one time. And the tough doesn't like sharp edges on cars. So um, there's been a bit of um, creative accounting going on with the sharp edges here. All these eyelashes have these protruding edges around the front as they came from the factory. But in Germany, they, they didn't like that. So somebody has put some clear plastic round here, which is very, very um, improvised. And the other thing is, on the later production Muras that were going to Germany, because they didn't like sharp edges, they completely got rid of these, again, fabricated grills out of sheet. These are actually aluminium. Um, and this one folds up so that you can, uh, you can fill the petrol tank, basically. But the, um, all this was abolished for the German market. They went on to a sort of little moulding, which was smooth and nice and cuddly for any pedestrians who decided to throw themselves in front of a Mura. Uh, and their sort of fanaticism for getting rid of these sharp bits extends to other bits of the car as well. Uh, the tops of the doors, and the sort of slats along the back of the doors, things like that. And uh, also these rather... Um, interesting appendages on the front here, which I have never in 35 years of working on Lamborghinis seen before. Um, these are uh, not going to go back on the car after restoration. They're um, pretty dreadful, really. Uh, and they don't do anything for the look of the car. So um, there are one or two other interesting things. This car is very original. I believe the front end was repainted at some point in the car's life. It's had a bit of a knock, but the rest of the car, uh, the paintwork is, I'm pretty convinced, factory original. And some of the details on the car, um, these, uh, these windscreen wiper blades, just to get really nerdy for a moment, are um, Trico speed blades, they were called in period. This was one of the first cars to have them. They were fitted as standard equipment on Rolls-Royce, Jaguar, Ferrari, all sorts of um, sort of cars that would do 
120 plus miles an hour. And they, they were sort of cutting edge technology at the time in terms of keeping the wipers actually working on the windscreen as opposed to lifting from the screen at high speeds. Um, and it's really refreshing to see these still on this car. So many people who restore mirrors don't drill down into that level of detail. So um, we're gonna take a look around the car and just see why this car is so very special in other ways. So one of the bywords for classic car restoration is to not over restore the car. There's been quite a fashion over the decades, particularly in the 1980s, for sort of re-chroming everything in sight, basically around the engine and things like that. Uh, that's, things have moved on from that now and originality and preservation are key because we're just losing originality and preservation. As soon as somebody touches a car, they're sort of potentially ratcheting down the originality of that car. And one of the beauties of this car is that um, this is factory paintwork. I'm not sure whether we can salvage it or not. We need to have a look into that really. Uh, but the, um, the car was supplied new in Germany by Hubert Hahn, the, uh, the importer at the time. Uh, who was a real Lamborghini enthusiast. He had the factory made some special models for him. So it's really lovely that, that his sort of dealer sticker is still on the car from 1969. So if we do have to repaint the car, and I think we will because I think there is some corrosion in one or two places and you can't really do localized paintwork at this level, um, then we're gonna have to carefully try and preserve that decal from 1969 I'm under express instructions from the owner to, uh, to do that. So no pressure there. Um, these are all, there's a particular way that the factory painted these vents on the doors, because obviously you've got body color. These were brazed on sections of steel. And I can tell that these are actually factory painted from new. So this door has never had paint work. Um, the edges are just, just the way they masked off the edges and things like that. It can be improved upon with more modern technology, let's say. Um, you can see here these lovely little bits of foam uh, on the edges. Again, this is to do with law compliance at the time. The Germans didn't like that one's still there, that one's still there. These are missing, but um, the German laws at the time didn't like sharp edges, so um, I'm hoping that we can restore the car without having to put all these back on because um, I, the funny thing is, ironically, I think for classic cars, if anything, the laws have, um, have uh, been sort of made more lenient over the years. I mean, in the UK, for example, a car doesn't have to have an MOT anymore as long as it complies to a, a basic legal standard because it's so different from a modern car. Um, so we're going to have a look inside this car now and just check out the interior. So what we're looking at here is possibly one of the most original Muir interiors left in the world. Because of its history with its two owners from new, uh, we know the history right back to day one. So the car's done 27,000 and odd kilometers, 18,000 miles. The materials that Lamborghini used at this time weren't particularly high quality. If you ordered a leather interior on a Mura S, you got leather seat facings and leather headrests and the rest was vinyl. The dashboard and the centre console, they started life as a sort of charcoal-y coloured black, um, dark grey vinyl. But over time, what happens is they fade slightly with UV light and get this slightly brownish hue to them. And that's exactly what's happened with these. It's consistent with the use, it's consistent with the mileage, and it's all still in really lovely condition. Uh, the only thing that has been done is these pretty awful four-point seat belts. It's very difficult to install seat belts on a Mura because there's no room for everything. The car is so tiny, and by the time you fitted a four liter V12 in and all the rest of it, there's just hardly any room for anything else. And seat belts are no exception. So people came up with all sorts of solutions to fit um, seat belts in Muras, and this was this car's. So these are gonna go, we're gonna come up with something rather more elegant and more in keeping really, but the seat material, this vinyl on the seats, this leatherette, the, uh, the cloth in the middle of the seats, 
is all exactly as Lamborghini built it. And the byword for this is going to be extremely careful conservation. In fact, this is the reason why we got the job because um, the, when the gentleman bought the car, he said to me, how would you go about restoring this? And I said, well, we would take out the interior, carefully preserve it and not touch it. And he said, aces, you've got the job basically. So that's great. <clears throat> One thing of particular interest, uh, these door seal designs were something that Marcello Gandini and Bertoni, when they were engineering the body shell on this car, came up with. Uh, they used li like little brass um, extrusions or folded brass sections to hold the door trims on, and they're extremely finicky to work with. They are almost impossible to get right. They take days just to fit the door, the door seals to the car. And these days, you, people, what they did on Lamborghini did on the later models of Miura, the SV, um, was they actually got sort of generic car door seals that other manufacturers used at the time and just tapped them on with a soft face hammer around the lip. Um, and this was a sort of far cheaper and quicker solution. But the original Muras has a one piece rubber molding that goes right round the door seal, door aperture. And then it's held in with these lovely little brass strips. And I think you know where I'm going with this. This has still got them. This has still got the brass strips. It's still got those lovely original rubber uh, door seals. We can't reuse the door seals, but we can carefully remove the brass bits, if you like, and put those back on afterwards after they've been carefully painted and treated. So it's all these things that it's very easy for somebody just to rip these brass things out over the years, as many people have, and tap on sort of more modern off the peg universal door seals. It's just these lovely little details that are going to set this car apart. So all good. Even the steering wheel is perfectly reusable. Um, everything is just the carpets are the original factory carpets there's a particular pile of carpet that Lamborghini used at the time these are all there it's going to be a real challenge for us to unglue these carpets and keep them in one piece but hopefully with time and care we can do it but it is a challenge but um, well worth it so now we're going to have a look at the heart of the machine the engine and again this is a uh, looks as though it hasn't been touched since Adam was a lad, but that's fine, we can cope with that. I'd much rather that than uh, people who've sort of messed things up over the years. So it's all here, it's all beautifully original. Uh, what a fantastic canvas to start from, really. So we're gonna be charting this car's progress over the coming videos, and as we take the car apart and start to look at things more closely, we can see what's going on inside. One of the particular concerns I have is what the inside of the engine is like, the cooling passages, because if there's corrosion happened within the water jacket in the engine, as it's called, um, that could be our biggest headache, really. Anything, just about anything else we can cope with, but um, time will tell. Let's move on to our next job now. So another victim we've got here is this Ferrari from 1970. Uh, this is a, a 365 GT 2 plus 2, to give it its proper model name, um, but it was more unkindly called the Queen Mary in period, because uh, for Ferrari it was quite a departure, this car. It's a big car, and it was designed for the family man who wants to still drive a Ferrari, basically. So it's, it's a 2 plus 2, but it's got quite big plus 2 seating in the back. And in fact, this car was so user-friendly with uh, power steering and air conditioning as standard, that um, Enzo Ferrari actually reputedly used one of these as his everyday transport for quite a while. It was styled by Pininfarina, nice shape, but a big car. Uh, but the engine is the sort of evergreen Ferrari V12, uh, in this case a 4.4 litre, 365 is the CC of every cylinder, so 365 times 12 is 4,400, 4.4 litre. Um, and this car came in with a, quite a few running faults, really. It wasn't a happy, happy chappy at all. So we've stripped the engine down and we found some not very great things. So let's have a look at that. So please forgive the, uh, the parts strewn on our car lift, but we're just so busy. We're having to rearrange benches to, uh, to fit bits on. But this is the 
the, the Ferrari V12 stripped down. So um, it's a single overhead camshaft design, which was sort of Ferrari was still using in the late 1960s. Uh, Ferrari really upped the game by going to a four cam V12, as it's called, to help with breathing and hence power. And uh, Ferrari realized that he was suddenly a bit behind the curve, so, but he didn't have to look very far. He just went into the competition department, blew the dust off a couple of engine parts that were in there, and all of a sudden he had a four cam V12. So, um, but this engine is quite traditional. It traces its lineage right back to the late 1940s when Enzo Ferrari first started up. The architecturally, it's almost the same as that engine. Um, if you know, same basic concept, but um, this engine in particular has had some um, unfortunate attention in the past and it's had one or two maladies as well. It's had some bad moments. So the, um, we've stripped the whole engine down. It was pretty full of sludge. There's a lot of black sludge still in the sump and things like that. Uh, and um, I can show you some of the more sort of um, detailed bits as we go. So, for example, um, on this particular engine, the, um, the valve uh, in the valve guide has got an awful lot of play. In fact, I'm going to go further than that and say I've never in 35 years seen a valve in a valve guide with this much play. So the play should be minimal. It should be sort of like that. Um, and this valve, you can actually hear it, never mind see it. Uh, that is incredible. I'm, I'm amazed the engine still ran, but it's potentially a, a, a mechanical disaster waiting to happen. This engine was ready to let go in all sorts of ways, so we've nipped it in the bud really in time. This is the heart of the engine, the, the cylinder block, and some of the cylinders, have, it's been stood for a while, there's quite a few of these engines have, and what happens is you get condensation inside the actual engine which can't get out, it sort of works its way in through humidity from the air, and Quite a few of the cylinder liners um, where the pistons run up and down have actually got corrosion inside them. So they're never going to work properly when it's like that. They're actually rusty. The internals of the engine are rusty, uh, which is not great. So the rings on the pistons can't do their job properly and we have to do some surgery on that. More about that as we go. We've just literally torn the engine apart in the last 24 hours. So um, there we go. So that wraps up our first uh, Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video. Hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please like, subscribe, whatever you want to do. Uh, it would be very encouraging. And um, we'll have some more workshop insights soon.